you ever thought about the importance of language? Imagine traveling to a place where nobody speaks the languages that you speak. You're very hungry after your long flight, so you walk into a cafe. How would you communicate your order to the person behind the counter? Chances are you'd use a variety of gestures to get your point across. Maybe you'd point to a menu with pictures, or point to a sandwich in a glass case. Maybe you would mime eating a cup of soup with a spoon. As humans, we use language to express our ideas. Sometimes the things we need to express are simple enough that we don't need words. A facial expression or a gesture will do the trick. Other animals use sounds, gestures, and expressions to communicate too, but what sets humans apart is how complex and limitless our language system is. I mean, really, you can say anything. Wow! The land of make-believe! But we aren't born knowing how to talk. At first, babies have little concept of grammar, gesture, or social norms, and their brains aren't that great at interpreting signals from their eyes or their ears yet. It's a little like riding a merry-go-round until you're dizzy in a foreign country while wearing sunglasses on a cloudy day and then trying to order a sandwich. Also, you're not on Earth, you're on Mars. Luckily, human brains have specific regions dedicated to processing the complex sounds of language, and babies' brains quickly get to work on cracking the code. Scientists have shown that babies who are only a few days old prefer listening to the language that their mothers speak over an unfamiliar language, which is evidence that they start listening to their mothers before birth. In fact, when babies are born, and for a few months after, they are able to differentiate between all speech sounds, even the ones that aren't commonly used in the languages that their parents speak. However, as babies get closer to being one year old, they lose the ability to tell apart sounds if their native language doesn't use those sounds. For instance, in Japanese, there's just one speech sound category for the sounds that English separates into R and L. So at first, babies learning Japanese or English can both learn R and L, no problem. But eventually, Japanese learners collapse those sounds and have more difficulty hearing the difference between the English words fly and fry, while English learners keep them separate, which is good because only one of those should be dipped in ketchup and eaten. <laughs> By the time they're six months old, babies have started to put together that language has meaning, that certain sound combinations refer to certain things. For example, a six-month-old might look at a bottle when you say bottle, which is really impressive given that we talk a lot more like this, do you want your bottle? Then like this, do you want your bottle? Think about all of the things that the baby has to keep track of in order to understand the meaning of those sounds, ba, tol. The baby has to have enough experiences hearing those sounds to be able to pull it out of a full sentence. They also have to engage their senses. Seeing a bottle in mom's hand when she talks about it will help the baby make the connection that bottle is what we call those cylindrical objects with the pointy <laughs> top. Babies who are learning spoken language practice speaking for several months before they start to say real words. Baby babble is meaningless, but it's not pointless. Babies are closely tracking adults and picking up on the social cues of how to have a conversation, even if they can't quite add anything meaningful yet. That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Exactly what I was thinking. Soon enough, babies say their first recognizable words. We know when their words start to have meaning because they say them at appropriate times, like saying hi or bye-bye when coming or going. Once they have several words in their vocabulary, they start to string together two words into phrases and sentences. After that, it's not long before they have their own full-fledged, very important conversations. Raining. No, it's wiggling. No, it's raining. My mom told me it's wiggling. It was raining. No. Yes, my, it is. My, my mom told me it was wiggling, not yes. raining. My mom said it is raining. Okay, so you have to experience language to learn language. This is true of both spoken languages and signed languages. We'll focus on sign language in a few minutes, but first, let's talk about the sense of hearing, which is important for learning and using spoken languages. How does hearing work? When someone's vocal cords vibrate, they make sound waves. Those sound waves are carried through the air to reach your ears. The pinna, or outer portion of the ear, helps to focus sound waves into the middle and inner ear. Having two ears allows you to pin a point which direction sound is coming from, as one ear is usually closer to the source of the sound than the other. Sound waves travel through the auditory canal, causing your eardrums and the tiny bones of your middle ear to vibrate. These vibrations activate tiny hair-like structures, which are called stereocilia. Stereocilia are located in the cochlea, which is a coiled structure in your inner ear that looks like a snail. The stereocilia convert vibrations to electrical signals, which are picked up by your auditory nerve and carried to your brain. The brain interprets electrical impulses as sound, and the appropriate regions of the brain are activated to process the sound, including a highly specialized processing pathway for speech sounds. It's not all about the ears, though. Vision is also an important part of human communication. What you see can change how your brain interprets sounds. Check this out. Bar, 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 bar. What do you hear? If you heard bar, 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 you'd be right. 
But how about now? Bar, 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 bar. Chances are you heard far, far, far this time with an F. Except you didn't. In fact, the audio didn't even change between the two videos. Bar, bar, bar. Strange bar, as it may seem, what bar, you hear depends on which bar. video you're looking at. Go ahead, take turns watching bar, each video and see how the sound morphs. Bar, bar, bar. This is a perfect example of something called the McGurk effect, which shows how our visuals can alter what we believe we're hearing. We also use our sense of vision to read other people's emotions through their facial expressions and body language. On top of that, waving, pointing, and clapping are all gestures or ways to communicate without speaking. Gestures are some of the first ways that we learn to communicate. Babies do these things before they can even talk. So what happens if someone doesn't have the ability to hear or the ability to see? Can they still communicate? Some babies are deaf or hard of hearing, and some babies are blind or have low vision. That doesn't mean that they won't learn to communicate. Human brains are amazingly adaptable and can be rewired to, for example, use a visual language like sign language instead of a spoken language to communicate. Sign languages consist entirely of gestures, facial expressions, and hand movements. Sign languages have their own complex structure and grammar. It's not just a one-to-one -one translation of spoken language. For example, in American Sign Language, question words like how come at the end of a sentence. Kylie, deaf? How? Uh, you were born deaf? Whoa. You don't have to be deaf or hard of hearing to learn sign language. Babies who learn sign language learn from fluent signers, just like babies learning a spoken language learn from fluent speakers. Signing babies pass through different phases of language development, just like speaking babies do. First, they babble with their hands, making small sign-like gestures that aren't actually words, like a baby saying ga ga ga. Then they sign single words. Then they begin to put together simple phrases, which grow in complexity as the child gets older. People who use sign language may use an interpreter to help them communicate with people who speak but don't sign, just like two people who speak different languages might use a translator. Some children who are deaf or hard of hearing use a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. Hearing aids pick up sounds using a microphone and play them at a louder volume using a speaker that sits in the user's ear. A cochlear implant is an electronic device that's partly inside the ear and under the user's skin, and partly outside of the ear. A microphone on the outside picks up noises and sends them to a device that has been placed in the user's cochlea, the curly part of the inner ear. The device directly stimulates the part of the ear that creates electrical impulses for the auditory nerve to carry to the brain. Hearing aids and cochlear implants can give babies access to the sound of people talking around them and the sound of their own voice. Babies who use hearing aids or cochlear implants may learn to speak after having the implants for some time, or they may communicate through sign language, or they might use both speaking and sign language. So that's a little bit about how hearing and communication and sign language work. What about vision? Babies who have low vision and babies who are blind have a different experience of the world from sighted babies. Think about if someone said to you, a pangle is a type of sprog. You've never seen a pangle before. You're not sure what sprog means. Without more description, you're pretty lost. Those words could mean almost anything, but you do know more about those words than you think. Context clues from the structure of language tell you that pangle and sprog are both nouns and that the words are related in a specific way. For a baby without vision, the same type of confusion could happen the first time somebody says a dog is a type of animal. But there are many other sensory experiences we can associate with a dog other than what they look like. Dogs have soft fur and cold, wet noses. They pant and bark, and they might lick your fingers or your chin. <laughs> <laughs> a parent of a blind baby may help their child pay special attention to the way that the dog feels and sounds. Through description and through using the senses of touch, taste, and smell, many blind children can learn to communicate using spoken language. Thanks to the brain's remarkable remarkable ability to adapt and rewire itself, senses such as hearing and touch can grow to be much more sensitive than they are for a sighted person. In some ways, a particularly keen sense of hearing or touch can provide information that's similar to vision. For example, even though people who are blind or have low vision may not be able to see someone approaching, they might be able to tell if it's someone familiar or a stranger using the sound of a person's steps. A recap. Our human brains allow us to learn language rather effortlessly and quickly over the first few years of our lives. We interpret signals from our ears and our eyes to make sense of the world around us. Yet, even in the absence of vision or hearing, humans can adapt to communicate in different but effective ways. So what? Language and communication touch every aspect of our lives. It's part of how we socialize, how we entertain ourselves, how we make progress, learn history, and invent new things. Language helps us represent our thoughts, no matter how simple or complicated they are. Language is also unique to humans. Dogs, monkeys, dolphins, and computers can be trained to understand certain aspects of language, but they aren't nearly as good as your average three-year-old. Artificial intelligence has made leaps and bounds in recent years, and yet, I love so.
Big baby chair. Baby chair. Explicit isn't included with Prime, but is available Alexa. with Amazon Music. Alexa, play baby chair. Alexa, play baby chair. Sure, baby, hold back by Say Anything on Amazon Music. Some scientists study the brain, vision, hearing, how we think, how kids learn, and how we communicate, just like other scientists study cells, chemical reactions, and how to send rovers to Mars. As a scientist, you could ask the question, do bananas improve athletic performance? And then you could make a guess about the answer, like, eating a banana 30 minutes before running a mile will result in a faster running time than if the same runner eats a string cheese. Or you could ask a question about learning. Do kids learn the name for a toy better if that toy has eyes or no eyes? Answers to these questions tell us about our innate curiosity. What makes us tick even when we're small? What motivates us to learn about the world? As scientists isolate aspects of the learning process, and as they understand more and more about how our human brains work, they get closer and closer to being able to provide information about real-world problems. Scientists have developed ways to tap into babies' thoughts, even before they can talk, by measuring electricity in their brain, tracking what pictures they look at on a screen, and timing how long they pay attention to something. Here's an example of how studying language development in infants can provide useful information. Parents who speak more than one language around their babies might wonder, will my baby get confused if I speak two different languages? How will they be able to tell the two languages apart? Evidence from baby science has shown that babies who hear two languages are able to keep the languages separate without getting confused. Babies are way better than adults at learning multiple languages. So where does that leave us? Language and communication are complicated. Humans are adaptable to different types of sensory experience, and scientists study language every day. We hope you've enjoyed learning about language, communication, and the magical minds of babies. Check out our website, blog, and TikTok if you're interested in hearing more about our lab's work at Duke.